Dit is Papa Alfa Noël Eco Tingo Eco voor de Daily Minutes met de nieuwsupdate voor vandaag, 5 september 2016. Dit is het bulletin van maandag. Omdat ik om half zes, eigenlijk net voor half zes, nog door een klant gebeld werd, ben ik extreem laat voor het maken van de uitzending. Als plaatje en morsen herhaal ik daarom waarschijnlijk die van vrijdag. En verder hebben we vandaag het tweede deel, voor één keer op maandag ook in het Engels, over FSQ. Ik heb nog wel een nieuwtje, want PI3UTR is weer als vanouds beschikbaar vanaf de Gebranditoren met een nieuwe eindtrap. En de berichten die ik erover hoor zijn overwegend goed, behalve een beetje in het noorden is dat geloof ik iets minder. Verder doet hierdoor, en dat vind ik zelf ook erg leuk, de web SDR vanuit Hilversum op 2 meter het ook weer. Nou, op naar de FSQ. Let's talk about the emergency communications application of FSQ. As you probably realize, a lot of emergency communications these days is done on VHF and UHF, but it relies on what I call infrastructure. You need to have repeaters. You can't get very far unless you do. The whole aim of FSQ is that it provides digital capability without requiring infrastructure. In other words, you can be 100 kilometers away from your nearest contact station and you may have had some sort of civil emergency, but you're able to contact someone out of the area easily. If the emergency is quite widespread, then you can contact people in other parts of the area. And it's especially important in our country because it's not only sparsely populated, but it's quite hilly and with a lot of forest. So VHF comms is really not practical. While we do have some repeaters, you can guarantee that in time of civil emergency, an earthquake or a tornado or a tsunami, that those things won't be available. That's why uh, the use of NVIS. There's no other means of getting propagation from one point to another with relatively simple equipment when you've got hills and forests in the way. You need to use the ionosphere. We really need to take a minute to define NVIS. Near vertical incidence signals. In other words, signals that go up, not necessarily vertically, but not out horizontally, that go up into the ionosphere and hit the E layer, which is about 30 to 50 kilometers up, or the F layer, which might be 300 kilometers up, and then turn around and come back down again. If you're far enough away, there won't be any ground wave signal. You'll just get signals that have come back from the ionosphere to your station. Unfortunately, there are several paths. As I said, E layer and F1 and F2, because there are two F layers often. Uh, During the day, there are certainly two F layers. Consequently, you get signals from these three different sources, which have different timing and also have different frequencies because the layers are moving, so you get Doppler shift. That's the nature of NVIS. You get multiple signals arriving because if you're close enough, you can get ground wave as well. And they all have different timing. They can have different frequencies, and their signal strengths vary up and down. So when they interfere with each other, you get considerable fading and so on. So you need a huge fade margin to be able to handle signals like that, and you have to have a mode that will handle large changes in timing and large changes in frequency. By large, I mean it's about one ppm, one hertz per megahertz of frequency shift. The frequencies we're talking about where NVIS operation works between, say, two megahertz and 10 megahertz, and during the day, the higher frequencies work, and during the end at night, the lower frequencies work. So the advantage of NVIS is that you can be on one side of a mountain and you need to get a signal to the other side, FSQ would work for that. My friend Con, who's the guy that has written the software, lives in Gisborne, which is 300 kilometers from here. We have no trouble at all talking to each other most of the day on 40 meters and most of the night on 80 meters. In winter, the crossover point is a bit touchy around about 5 p.m. where... 40 meters can die out before 80 meters is picked up. But late at night on 80 meters, we hear VK6s running FSQ. That's the western side of Australia, 3,000 kilometers away. Tell me about the software. The original software, written by Con Tito 2 fp was written in standard NCC, and it's a simple standalone program. It's been copied and adapted slightly by a couple of Americans and added a couple of Americanized features especially for relaying. That's something the Americans are really keen on, relaying messages. NW8L and KA4CDN are the two guys. The original ZL2FP code is public domain. He's released the source code for it. These two guys took the source code and tweaked it a bit, but their program has a few other features, but it essentially looks exactly the same and works the same. There's a third 
program currently available, and that's been done quite differently, done by Dave, W1HKJ, who is the FL Digi man. He has adapted the code to fit into FL Digi. It functions a bit differently, and it's quite a bit more difficult to use, but it has several major advantages. First of all, it's in a suite of programs that runs all the other modes. It runs RTTY and PSK31 and so on. And that's been quite a challenge for him because it's the first mode that he's got in his suite that works as a chat mode. Uh, you press enter and it sends. That's different. It's not a uh, rag chew mode. Big, big advantage is the FL Digi version runs on Apple and Linux platforms. Whereas the original and the and the first American copy of it, purely Windows programs. Although they will work, work on Linux if you use Wine. The point is that with a, an NVIS setup, you can put up an antenna for 80 metres that's quite low to the ground. In fact, on 40 metres, I frequently just dangle it on a fence or a hedge. It doesn't need to be up very high because you're wanting the signals to go up anyway. For an emergency station, you can get out there with your car and your, your gear and, and connect up very easily. And then you've got comms for 50 to two or 300 kilometres. And you can send formal messages as well as just conversations and, and orders and, and things like that. Much simpler and cheaper than any of the more formal selective calling systems. More importantly, it's ad hoc, meaning anybody can be involved. It all works by call sign. You don't have to have pre-registered station IDs. You don't have to have your gear pre-programmed. There are no pre-programmed frequencies and all that sort of thing, which is what happens with other selective calling systems. And, of course, the ad hoc thing is very, very important in an emergency situation because you have to work with what you've got. That's that aspect of it. So you can use it for order wire, in other words, telling a station what to do and where to go. You can use it for sending messages to stations, which they can record. You can send formal radiograms, pictures back and forth. You can use your webcam to send a picture. I would imagine in a real live emergency, your base station would need to be set up for at least two bands because comms for some stations would drop out on one band before they went did it where it did on others, depending on the distance. But the whole thing has been thought about to be an infrastructure-free ad hoc system. That's essentially it. Where would I find FSQ, typically? The program itself lists the operating frequencies. There's a tab in the program called the Rules tab, which gives you instructions on how to basically operate the system, what you can and can't do, and how it works. It gives you a list of the calling frequencies. For Region 2, 80 metres is 3594, 40 metres is 7104, 30 metres is 10144. They are upper sideband dial frequencies. Give us those frequencies once more, please. 3594. 
Deze minutes zijn dagelijks vanaf ongeveer 1900 uur te beluisteren via PI2NOS. De uitzending wordt een dag later om half elf ochtends herhaald.